This video is part 2 of a 3 part series. If you would like to watch the first part, you can find it by clicking the link now available on screen. I would like to thank my Patreons for making this project possible. Your contributions every month have helped me upgrade and supply quite a few resources for this video. And given it took a while to make, I'm incredibly thankful for your trust. If you would like to support the finalization of this series, and myself as a content creator as a whole, please consider joining this group of cool guys. I would also like to thank all the people who have made one-time donations through PayPal and all the people who sent me nice emails, Discord messages and feedback in the comment section. Your messages were incredibly kind and encouraging. You've helped me source this video better and make it a more intelligent piece. And though I can thank each one of you by name, you were nevertheless important contributors to this endeavor. This incredible reception I had on the first video fueled me through the process of making this second, which you'll get to watch right now. When Britain conquered its North American Empire, it had to find solutions to lots of problems. First, it was now the government presiding over an area big enough to tap the northern Baltic in the north and the shores of Alexandria in the south, and span the distance from the Aral Sea to Edinburgh. This, while considering all the cultural and political complexities of the societies within these lands, as well as continuing to manage European politics and their rising empire, from their perspective at the time, the group that threatened North American stability the most were the Canadiens, as opposed to the 13 colonies the province of Quebec was inhabited by a foreign people that might have at any moment rebelled. In many ways, they were doing that already, something that Britain sought to stop. If Britain made all the concessions it made in the Quebec Act, it was largely because delivering constant responses to Quebec's many problems was becoming a burden on their ability to manage said territory. However, Britain also had another thing in mind, containing the power of their semi-autonomous colonies further in the south. The 13 colonies saw the defeat of New France as a tremendous opportunity. Now they could finally expand their religion, their markets and their lands to a new frontier. But they were stopped on their tracks by Parliament, who instead levied them with taxes to pay for the costs of the war that they had just fought. In these circumstances, Americans seeking their independence was maybe inevitable. In removing the French threat from the 13 colonies, the case for local management and self-rule was increasingly evident. Britain made the argument for its military presence and its presence overall obsolete. Still, the American colonists remained British subjects, and as King George's subjects, he expected them to comply with his plans. America often romanticizes George some exceptional tyrant in their national myths, but Many of the choices of his government were really compromises to face challenges at home and to keep this behemoth of a continent together. Britain's key concern was that had the empire not tried to close up its ties to America, these colonies might have just become an entity too powerful to reign and too independent to rule, as they eventually did. Britain lost its war against the Americans, which left it humiliated, weakened and deeply in debt. The French king helped the Americans in this revolution as part of those European politics of hostility we have discussed before. It could have been in his demands to this fledgling republic to reclaim the lost territories. Yet France did no such thing. One can almost imagine how the nobility sighed in relief now that managing Canada was the Brits' problem, and the Brits' problem it was. The UK inherited the exact uncomfortable geopolitical position that New France had had to deal with, with the added complication that they were a colonial empire fighting against home advantage. If it had been a British interest for the French Canadians not to rebel, now it was triply so, lest they lose even more of their hold of North America. But the Bourbons would not get the last laugh, because this aid to the Americans was also expensive for them, which led to yet another revolution. 
The French Revolution upended every social structure of monarchist Europe. In its earliest stages, it was actively subverting all facets of the medieval social hierarchies that had been the norm for centuries. The French, who were once one of the bastions of Catholicism along with the Austrians and the Spanish, were now tearing down crucifixes to raise altars to the goddess of reason. The reaction of the Vatican was one of utter panic, as its priests became the victims of expulsions and persecutions by the Directory. There was a real fear that the liberal ideas of the age would scorch through the nations of Christendom, which could mean a widespread weakening of the Church's political power. Yet another fear that was accurately placed, as this too eventually happened. To control British North America, a compliant Catholic Church negotiated the downscale of its position and economic power to guarantee the survival of the religion. And the effects this had in French Canadian society were drastic, because now, with other usual institutions such as the state or the army, the Catholic Church became the one single established entity through which the Canadian could organize as a group. This resulted in a curious quid pro quo between the King of England and the Holy See. Britain would not let another uprising in North America come about if they could do something about it, with Quebec being a prime point of attention for this. And the Vatican did not want the one remaining semblance of French medieval society to be lost to some New World flavor of Jacobinism. However, Britain's concerns were quickly settled. Many French Canadians disapproved of the revolution as some of those expelled priests made their way to the shores of the St. Lawrence with horror stories of the decapitated king. More significantly though, not every person in New England wanted to take part in the American project. So there was a massive immigration out of the nascent United States by loyalists who, throughout the independence process, had had their families harassed and their properties assaulted. Many went back to England in a campaign of resettlement, but another target location for them were the northern edges of the eastern Great Lakes, in the nearest lands of what the French called Les Pays d'Ono, or the Upper Country, and that today we call the province of Ontario. Over a few years, the population of Nova Scotia tripled with the influx of refugees, and those newcomers were not even the brunt of it, as the southern St. Lawrence lowlands would receive many, many more. The written commentary of the government officials who managed this are essentially long laments on the logistical nightmare that it was. Among these people were American Northerners, Southerners, black slaves, some of which were promised freedom if they made it to the territory, and indigenous peoples fleeing from American expansionism, mainly Iroquoians. It is estimated that around 90,000 people moved. The plus for Britain, though, was that these lands that were inhabited by the potentially rebellious French were swarmed by fervent pro-British settlers. People who saw this American project as an unruly experiment headed for disaster, one that was not worth the trouble of the political structures they knew and wanted to hold on to. This impression, that of Canadian common sense, in contrast with American rashness, arguably continues to this day in the country's self-perception. And, for the matter at hand, these loyalists brought with them a desire for the reproduction of these same forms of government. They desired everything they had had in New England, such as legislative assemblies and English common law. Britain was skeptical of extending these institutions to colonial subjects again, but in some ways they ended up materializing. Though, the extent to which these legislative assemblies operated as local, accountable governments was limited. Britain did not want to repeat its first American experiment, so it ruled the Canadas by putting its own interests first. It would turn British North America into a heavily export-dependent economy, from where it would get resources for its own enterprises, mainly from an emerging wood industry, as the forests of Canada would become the ships of the empire. The people in the highest positions of power would be powerful merchant families who benefited from the extraction of these resources, such as timber and wheat. When Napoleon set up the continental system, Britain had to trade more and more with its empire, which made many of these circles incredibly rich. Additionally, though the assemblies were staffed by locals, the governors were still appointed by Britain, who then appointed councils that could advise against enacting the measures that conflicted with the interests of the empire, even if they came from elected officials. The Crown also continued treating Canada like a military control zone, much like France had done, and it would use the territory to contain a possible expansion of the United States. 
They built outposts that then became towns and cities. If you look at a population density map of Canada, you will notice it is very bottom heavy. Because of these security priorities, about 90% of Canadians live about a two hour drive away from the United States. Now, the pro-British inhabitants didn't have too much of a problem with these designs, but it was up in the air just how much these new institutions would conflict with the Quebec Act and the French colonists. So in what was probably the most important decision of this tale, the British Parliament decided to divide what remained of the province of Quebec in two. Lower Canada, that was majority French and largely under the Catholic Church and the custom of Paris, and Upper Canada, which progressed as a through and through British colonial society. It is not precisely accurate to say that these policies or these two people's divisions were instigators of conflict though. The English newcomers and the French inhabitants had fought against each other. They had ethnic tensions as well, but to say that they had been enemies blurs individual realities of the time. Their leaders had been enemies. But now that they were living together in a framework that they were more or less content with, life just went on. One could say that Canadian bilingualism did not begin with policies and law. It began in public spaces like the streets of Montreal, where neighbors of different backgrounds talked to each other in the markets, the workplace and the streets. People who were now coexisting and had a need to communicate across language barriers to live in this difficult, freezing country. There were French Canadian volunteers and professional soldiers who fought united in purpose with British regulars to repel various American invasion attempts during the Revolutionary War and then again during the War of 1812. Deeper antagonisms would flare up later, but how did that start? With the end of the Napoleonic Wars, the English stopped, well, dying basically, and Britain now had a surplus population it started to get rid of by sending people to the colonies. In the first half of the 19th century, over half a million immigrants left for Canada. Many of these would disembark in the ports of Quebec City and Lower Canada, before then heading up to Upper Canada or the United States, with a significant number staying in the province itself. The Irish Rebellion and later Potato Famine made Canada a hotspot destination for immigrants. Destitute Irish farmers and the middle classes of Ireland, frustrated with Britain's post-war economy, moved in and found lots in common with the Catholic inhabitants of Lower Canada. This resulted in the curious formation of irlando quebecois communities, who integrated into French-Canadian culture without caring much for what the English had to say. Many of them have become beloved cultural and community icons, from hockey players to SpongeBob's voice actor. They were, however, not warmly greeted from the get-go. The ships they came in triggered a cholera epidemic in Lower Canada, which people ascribed to Britain's ham-fisted mass movements of people. The arrival of English settlers ramped up ever more, and over the first decades of the colony's new British administration, the English immigrants started to slowly catch up in numbers to the Canadiens. In Montreal and Quebec City, the split had become about 50-50. The French-Canadian intelligentsia, that is, specialized and educated professionals from the Catholic education systems, also had reasons to resent the cliques that had come to rule over the colony. They aspired to positions of power of their own that the restrictive political system did not allow them to reach, a sentiment that many of their English-Canadian counterparts in Upper Canada shared with their own version of the same problem. The French-Canadians in the peasantry did not have it good either. The seigneurial system was starting to collapse, as more and more landowners had their plots either seized or bought. Now, there's debate about just how much of an agricultural crisis there was in this period, or if there was one at all, but certain ecological disasters and economic externalities had caused arguable declines in family incomes and land ownership for the habitants. This led to a coalition of the bourgeoisie with the peasants in a French-Canadian interest party that would compete for positions in the legislative assemblies. They came together in the Parti Canadien, which would become more radical, liberal and republican over the years, widening its basis and renaming itself to a more inclusive Parti Patriote. This party supported increasing the democratic power of the legislative assemblies. Three quarters of Lower Canada remained French. Lower Canada itself was still more populous than Upper Canada, so more direct forms of democracy would be to their obvious benefit and, of course, to the detriment of the pro britain Tories, whose concerns were raised for two big reasons. On one hand, it was setting the stage for the French rebellion that the elites were trying to avoid. On another, 
the movement was piquing the interest of the United States of America. Soon enough, paramilitaries of the Reform and Tory factions started to organize and clash in the streets, and thus begin the Canadian rebellions. But we'll focus on the French one. Louis-Joseph Papineau, the leader of the Patriots and the counterpart of William Lyon Mackenzie, was not really a Jacobin nationalist. One of his closest friends and collaborators was Irish. He supported the social role of the Catholic Church despite not caring about it himself, and in 1832 his lower Canadian government was the first to give full legal rights to Jewish people, the first administration to do so in the British Empire, as Britain would take 27 more years to do so. His views were very nuanced, but certainly liberal in the context of the time. His main political interests were preserving the seigneurial system and other distinctive Canadian institutions, rejecting the radical elements of his movement who wanted to start a peasant revolt or even declare independence. However, he was very successful in galvanizing the disgruntled masses, whose sentiments were more militant. While in power in 1834, he wrote the 92 Resolutions, a series of suggestions to London to reform the government and allow for responsible governance, a Westminster system with accountability, checks and balances. He reiterated in it his loyalty to the crown, and throughout the three years that Parliament kept his resolution on hold, he did his best to prevent a rebellion while trying to act in opposition to the government's unelected officials. Despite his best efforts and those of a sympathetic governor, Parliament rejected every suggestion he made, recommending ten very insulting alternatives instead. This was terrible for the moderate patriots, and exactly the justification the radicals needed to start an uprising. This was precipitated by Americans who were funneling weapons into Canada, seeing another opportunity to expand their way of state building, or maybe even their own state building. Though mirroring the struggles of the successful American independence movements of the previous decades in both spirit and substance, it was a very brief uprising. The Patriots were quashed in a year and four days. However, the briefness of the rebellion did not prevent it from traumatizing Canadian political culture. A ragtime army of rebels, much like the Americans 50 years before, had managed to deliver a defeat to British regulars at Saint-Denis, though in the long run they could not stand Britain's regular army. The Patriots were largely civilians with zero military experience who could not pose a realistic opposition to professional soldiers. The many revolutionary societies operating in the United States eventually abandoned their initiatives. The US did not wish to openly challenge the United Kingdom, so the Americans stepped out of the picture. The colonial government would then carry out reprisals against the Patriots, including Papineau himself, who went into exile. Others among the captured would be imprisoned, deported to Australia, or executed by hanging. For many Tory loyalists, some from that first generation that fled the 13 colonies, the Patriot Rebellion had just awakened some very unpleasant memories. The rhetoric of anti-elitism inevitably overlapped with the social resentment that many French Canadians had towards Britain and the English, especially the monopolistic merchant class of Montreal. For the following decade, the Canadian states would spend a significant amount of time trying to make sense of the rebellions. Britain would send one of its superstar statesmen to figure things out. A young Whig known as Lord Durham, who was given the task of understanding why the rebellions had happened. Lower Canada was put under martial law and he was given the governorship. Now we'll go on a short tangent to understand Durham's logic. Whigs were a type of British liberal and their theory of history was that all peoples were on a journey to achieve an idea of modernity. They view the progress of time as the transition of humanity from savagery to civilization, namely British ideas of civilization, and it became a widespread view among the elites of the empire. In some ways, it lingers on in our collective imagination as a western meme on modernization. Kraut will at some point create a more detailed video visiting the topic, which should be in an annotation here when it's ready, but for now, this is what you need to know. Lord Durham subscribed to this vision, and he saw in French Canadians a medieval and backwards people that needed correctives to integrate to an evolved society. In his own words, there can hardly be conceived a nationality so deprived of everything that can invigorate and elevate a people than that which is exhibited by the descendants of the French in Lower Canada, owing to their retaining their peculiar language and manners. They are a people with no history and no literature. 
In these circumstances, I should be indeed surprised if the more reflecting part of the French Canadians entertained at present any hope of continuing to preserve their nationality. Much as they struggle against it, it is obvious that the process of assimilation to English habits is already commencing. The English language is gaining ground, as the language of the rich and of the employers of labour naturally will. It appeared by some of the few returns that had been received by the Commissioner of Inquiry into the state of education that there are about ten times the number of French children in Quebec learning English as compared with English children who learn French. A considerable time must, of course, elapse before the change of language can spread over a whole people and justice and policy alike require that while the people continue to use the French language, their government should take no such means to force the English language upon them as would, in fact, deprive the great mass of the community of the protection of the laws. But I repeat that the alteration of the character of the province ought to be immediately entered on and firmly, though cautiously, followed up that in any plan which may be adopted for the future management of Lower Canada, the first object ought to be that of making it an English province. And that, with this end in view, the ascendancy should never again be placed in any hands but those of an English population. Indeed, at the present moment, this is obviously necessary. In the state of mind in which I have described the French-Canadian population, as not only now being, but as likely for as long while to remain, the trusting them with an entire control over this province would be, in fact, only facilitating a rebellion. Lower Canada must be governed now, as it must be hereafter, by an English population. And thus, the policy which the necessities of the moment force on us is in accordance with that suggested by a comprehensive view of the future and permanent improvement of the province. This report is about a hundred pages long and it had at least one surprisingly insightful analysis. What Lord Durham had observed was that there were many different problems in Canada, many related to wealth disparity and political structures, but the more toxic manifestations of these always surfaced along ethnic lines. This is, that the differences in privileges and politics among Canadians were very closely related to their cultural identity, and to solve them, these should be addressed. Being loose and anachronistic with my words, we could call this an early form of intersectional thinking. The issue at hand, though, was that Durham, as a Whig, was a partisan of the Anglicization of the French Canadians. In this very Victorian flavor of racism, his problem with Quebec was that he viewed its people as infantile, married to backwards customs, and that they would ultimately benefit from English pragmatism to improve themselves and the society they were a part of. Ultimately, if this meant the disappearance of the French language and the French identity in general, well, this would just be a step forward in their Whig history evolution. This was written in 1839, and to the extent that the ideas it articulates inform Canada's particular flavor of anti-French sentiment, well, if you're Canadian, you can tell me yourself if that passage sounds like something you've heard someone say before. We will never know if Durham's suggestions would have any effect so, because they weren't enacted. Durham would be recalled from Canada for an abuse of power, and it was up to his successors to apply his recommendations. The instauration of representative government and the union of the Canadas into a single English project state. Oddly enough, the reason why it was difficult to achieve this was because of Upper Canada. With the installation of majority rule democratic mechanisms, they feared merging with the more populous Lower Canada. It is then that Durham's successor, Lord Sydenham, made a decision that would ruin Durham's vision forever. Provincial proportional representation, so that power would be more evenly split between jurisdictions rather than populations. This promise and the prospect of sharing its debt eventually convinced the Upper Canadians. The Canadas became a single Canada, divided now in the regions of Canada West and Canada East, which really were just Lower Canada and Upper Canada, again, just glued together, and, oddly enough, this move would ultimately benefit the political power of French Canadians more. 
It might not have seemed like it at the time, but what Durham knew and Sydenham overlooked was that the English population was growing faster than the French one. Of course, they had the benefit of migration, and it would soon be overtaken. Regardless, the instauration of responsible government came about. It quite literally had a baptism by fire when in the 1840s the upper and lower houses passed compensations for the lower Canadians who had lost property during the rebellion. This was incredibly unpopular with the Tories and the governor himself, but he ended up ratifying it as it was the law. Tory mobs then assaulted him in the street and set the parliament buildings of Montreal on fire, destroying them completely along with tens of thousands of documents that went as far back as the new French colonial administration. Today, the ruins are buried under a parking lot. Fyodor Dostoevsky was an incredibly prolific Russian writer and thinker. He is credited with being one of the first existentialists, inspiring various other philosophers, and authoring some of the greatest works in Russian literature. His way of writing characters was innovative in that it goes into an in-depth understanding of their motivations as a stepping stone to understanding their actions in a unique and distinctive way which also gained him mentioned honors, such as being one of the fathers of modern psychological fiction, as Freud himself had a lot of good things to say about the man. Politically, though, Dostoevsky was a gammon. He was in love with the Tsar and extremely critical of republicanism and constitutions, and expressed sympathy for what today we would call a genocide of the Ottoman Empire. This to create a Christianized Greater Russia that would save the souls of the Southern Slavs and Orthodox peoples. Despite having walked around some socialist reading circles in his life, he always supported traditional Russian property structures, perhaps not surprising as his family belonged to the aristocracy. All in all, Dostoevsky was a traditionalist. He believed that many of the social ills of his time were the direct consequence of abandoning Christian ideals. His vision of a good society, in particular a good Russian society, was one where every person fulfilled their Christian prerogatives. In his own words, If everyone were actively Christian, not a single social question would come up. If they were Christians, they would settle everything. But this idea is not very useful. There is wisdom in the proposition that governments and groups benefit from a common morality so that societies can work. However, to say, if all were truly Christian, no one would live in sin, is kind of like saying, if all followed the law, no one would commit crimes. It is a tautology, the insight in it is not new. In the Brothers Karamazov, what Dostoevsky considered his best work, and Freud called the greatest novel ever written, there is a scene in which a group of characters are discussing the modern relevance of ecclesiastical courts, a medieval institution through which Christian churches dealt with disputes in their jurisdiction, such as divorce. One of the characters in this conversation is presented to us as a renowned westernized intellectual, Ivan Fyodorovich. And the commentary he wrote on these courts is being discussed. I'm sorry, I have not read your article yet, but I've heard of it, said the elder, looking keenly and intently at Ivan. He takes up a most interesting position, continued the father librarian. As far as church jurisdiction is concerned, he is apparently quite opposed to the separation of church from state. That's interesting, but in what sense? Father Sosima asked. Ivan the later at last answered him, not condescendingly as Aljosha had feared, but with modesty and reserve, with evident goodwill and apparently without the slightest arrière-pensée. I start from the position that this confusion of elements, that is, of the essential principles of church and state, will, of course, go on forever, in spite of the fact that it is impossible for them to mingle, and that the confusion of these elements cannot lead to any consistent or even normal research 
for there is falsity at their very foundation of it. Compromise between the church and state in such questions as, for instance, the jurisdiction, is to my thinking impossible in any real sense. My clerical opponent maintains that the church holds a precise and defined position in the state. I maintain, on the contrary, that the church ought to include the whole state and not simply to occupy a corner in it. And if it is, for some reason, impossible at present, then it ought, in reality, to be set up as the direct and chief aim of the future development of Christian society. Oh, perfectly true, Father Pesci, the silent and learned monk, assented with fervor and decision. The purest ultramontanism, cried Musov impatiently, crossing and recrossing his legs. Oh, well, we have no mountains, cried Father Yosif. And turning to the elder, he continued. If you read the book yourself, which I encourage you to do, knowing this much about the man and his own political positions, you might understand this chapter a bit differently. I want to stress that I encourage you to read it. The book itself isn't a political essay and it has a lot of material for your thoughts. You might disagree with me and think of this video very differently. I just want you to check for yourself if Dostoevsky really does always steal man his philosophical opponents as some might say, because Muse of here, a character meant to represent European liberal values, is narratively dismissed after what might be a more reasonable criticism than he's been credited for. However, there is a more interesting thing we can do than challenge the ideas of a dead man that sadly cannot offer a reply. What if I told you I could show you an experiment, a society that made its virtual purpose the fulfillment of these very Christian prerogatives, and we could look at how it went. Dostoevsky was by day's end a utopian and a pacifist, and he was concerned with the alleviation of society's ills through a moral revival where great interventions would not be at play, at least not his interventions. Within the Christian churches, though, there have been and are schools of thought that share some form of Dostoevsky's vision, and as factions that have had to play power politics, they have different methods from Dostoevsky's dreamy-eyed approach to Christian revitalization and one of those was particularly powerful in Quebec. We're going to discuss Ultramontanism, this curious word thrown around by Musov. Ultramontanism is an ideology within Catholicism that pushes the idea that the Pope should be the de facto authority of faith and governance, a great power beyond the mountains, if that makes sense, moderating with a watchful eye both people and states, which, when directed by his guidance, can rightfully practice Christianity and contribute to the mission of expanding Christ's kingdom on earth, of course, through authority from and by the Vatican. This ideology has its origins in the medieval period, but it was strengthened in reaction to the various movements that came out of the Age of Enlightenment, and to make a long story short, it argued for doubling down on all the principles that the revolutions were questioning. Though the bishops of New France had made a pact with the United Kingdom, they weren't entirely trusting of Britain. By their values, they stood against the liberal movements of the time. For example, they threatened to excommunicate the Patriots during the uprising. The church's opposition to the rebellions gained them favors in the eyes of Britain, who decided to allow them to expand their orders. There was an enormous increase in the number of priests and nuns during the 1850s, along with the rise of Ultramontanism. The Church saw a double benefit to the survival of Canada's unique Francophone culture. The foothold the nation set for Catholicism in North America was delicate, but it also could be a hub for a renaissance, or at least serve as a century in this land surrounded by Protestants. Louis-François Laflèche, a bishop of Trois-Rivières and a fierce ultramontane, laid out this vision in writing. He postulated the French Canadians as a people with a mission set by Providence, to thrive and live as a bastion of North American Catholicism. To this end, they had to fulfill the will of God, from whose authority the state should derive its own. French people, and to that extent the French language, had to survive more than anything as keepers of the faith. Throughout the 19th century, it was usually Catholic clergy that came out in support and relief of the poor. Women's religious organizations would be among the most visible groups that extended a helping hand during harsh winters and pandemics. If they had been community leaders before, they now had even more leeway and credibility, and a great involvement in the politics of majority French districts. The church struggled constantly with the Canadian government for control over educational institutions. It would often freeze attempts of standardizing schooling in a way that was contrary to the preservation of their religious worldview. 
This protected French Canadian society from Britain and later the Dominion's assimilationist policies, but it also stagnated the academic output of the province. When Durham spoke about a people without literature, he could have well been talking about the fact that illiteracy in Quebec was almost universal by the time of his visit, and it would very slowly improve over time compared to that of the English. On some level, that was the government failing, though we could say deliberately trying to fail, to accommodate schooling for the Canadiens. But there were other reasons. One of them could be that in Protestantism, it's theologically important to have a personal relationship with God, to have an individual encounter with faith and also with scripture. It was important for Protestant families to have their children read the Bible so that they could do well as Christians, whereas Catholics have a canon that is revealed to believers by the priesthood. Whatever the factors, literacy and education lagged behind for French Canadians, which over the decades translated into a gap in generational wealth and furthered the perception of the English-Canadian minority of Canada East and later Quebec as a foreign colonizer elite. The social conservatism promoted by the Catholic Church also contributed to the continued growth of the French Canadian population. Women in French Canada married very young which meant they had bigger fertility windows, and it wasn't uncommon for families to have 8 to 12 children. This dramatic population growth helped even out the French-Canadian voting bloc versus the English-Canadian one, something that was known as the Revenge of the Cradle. To continue incentivizing this population growth, by the 1850s the church was also actively promoting settlement societies, through which French-Canadians started to move into the land of the First Nations. One of the main targets of this was the Inu, who were displaced from their homelands and had to increasingly participate in westernized Canadian society to survive, and they would only be among the first. Now with these new understandings of themselves, the Francophones would neglect and damage their historic friendship with the First Nations. As for the Catholic Church, it was so powerful that at one point, liberal Canadian MPs had to be very careful to not say or do anything that could upset the clergy. If, for whatever reason, a politician was being too much of a nuisance, the church could just tell the French Canadians that voting for them was a sin. And in many districts, that meant a ruined political career. It got so insidious that liberal MPs actually had to sue the church for election interference in 1876, and they won. The conservatives didn't have it any better either, especially since after the collapse of Papineau's movement, conservative politicians were now the targets of the church to check if they were conservative enough. Ultramontane figures started to make their way into power and prominence, whether liberal or conservative, and the more radical among them would advocate for church control of civic records, land distribution, and even ecclesiastical review of legislation. That is, laws passed by the regional parliament would need to be approved by Catholic advisors. At the level of society, the church only increased its role as a community center. You might be familiar with the secularization thesis. Don't worry about it if you don't know what it is by name, because the idea lives in our culture as common sense. This is the conception that as societies become wealthier, the demand for religion wanes. Life becomes more able to provide experiences and knowledge that were thought to be reserved to the supernatural. In that way, religious values are gradually replaced by humanistic ones. This is a pattern discussed in sociology. We can observe its practical fruits in religious sects that self-isolate to protect their customs from modernity, for example. Still, like all social theories, it is not a perfect model and Quebec's 19th century experience is a neat example of a case in which it fails. The second half of the 19th century was permeated by the dawn of industrial capitalism. The advent of the Gilded Age came to Quebec not as a destroyer of religion, but as its catalyst. Catholicism didn't go extinct, but adapted to the Industrial Revolution, as the many French Canadians who practiced their religion continued to organize along its lines, culturally and economically. On a different note, you can compare both versions of the Canadian National Anthem, which is a bilingual anthem. The original version was first written by a francophone in the 1880s, and in it you can see the clear-cut themes of Christian defensiveness parallel to the ultramontane vision of La Flèche. The English version goes... O oh Canada, our home and native land, true patriot love in all of us command, with glowing hearts we see thee rise, the true north, strong and free. From far and wide, O Canada, we stand on guard for thee. God keep our land glorious and free. 
O Canada, we stand on guard for thee. O Canada, we stand on guard for thee. And the French. O Canada, land of our ancestors, glorious deeds circle your brow. For your arm knows how to wield the sword. Your arm knows how to carry the cross. Your history is an epic of brilliant deeds, and your valor, steeped in faith, will protect our homes and our rights. Will protect our homes and our rights. For now, it's sufficient to say that this domination by the church was extensive, and it still sees in Quebecois society to this day. One way in which it does, that French people find rather odd and amusing, is that profanity in Quebec's French is very heavily coded by Christianity, the sacrés, as they're called. When a French Canadian swears, they do so by referring to the items of communion in Catholic Mass and other Christian terminology. Tabernacle, ciboire, calice, hostie, chris, simonac, sainte, sacrement. And stacking them together is increasingly rude, so please don't do it, this is just to make a point. <laughs> But this does leave a question open. Did it work? Did this actively Christian society with a Christian people and a Christian leadership really make for a prosperous, happy, and moral community? One that was worldwide enough for people to want to continue living in. Now, we certainly can't say this was a perfect materialization of the ultramontane vision. It wasn't a country wholly obedient to the papacy. But this government was an experiment within real-world constraints. A very serious attempt at realizing a vision at least. And we certainly can learn a couple of things from observing it. An important question is, to what degree was protecting the homes and rights of Catholics the same as protecting the homes and rights of French Canadians? Well, in this next half of the video we'll explore that question a bit. About two decades after the burning of Montreal's parliament, the Confederation period began. This was a process of integration of all the different colonies of British North America, which included the Canadas and some of the Eastern Maritimes, as they all came together in a self-governing union, within the Empire of course, called the Dominion of Canada in 1867. This effort was led by conservatives under the leadership of Canada's would-be first Prime Minister, John Alexander MacDonald. They sought to create a great Canadian state, spanning the entire north from sea to sea, connected through a massive effort of rail building. These politicians had very different reasons for seeking integration, but if you read their writings, you will see that chief among them is security from American aggression. The project of Canadian independence was a difficult process. Knowing about the internal divisions of the cultures within the territory, Canada's founding fathers decided to form an alliance in which provinces would retain their particular rights while agreeing to mutual defense and some degree of integration. Today, while Canada is a federation, it remains one of the most loose and decentralized of its kind. Aside from being difficult, this process was also delicate. Canadian Confederation was contemporary to another confederation project in the United States, and more generally, the American Civil War. This other confederacy was getting absolutely pummeled by the United States, and Canadian leaders were concerned they would be next. Just so you get a sizable idea of the threat, by 1860 the northern states had about 23 million people living in them. The confederacy had about 9 million, a third of which were slaves. At the moment of confederation in 1861, Canada had barely 3.4 million, about the same number of enslaved people in the south. This was the period where the famous Canadian Mounted Police was formed, as it was now necessary for the state to enforce its authority in the distant frontier. American expansionists and traders were ignoring the border and establishing their own presence north of Montana. 
to which Canada reacted by sending armed officers to kick them out. Effective as these units were, they weren't a long-term solution. The government of Canada, from its new seat in Ottawa, desperately wanted to have its own traders and expansionists there. In Canada East, there were many opponents to Confederation. The Parti Rouge, the party founded by Papineau that succeeded the Patriots, believed that uniting the Canadas had been in itself a threat to the French nature of the province. They didn't wish union with additional English colonies. And this led to a somewhat tragicomic moment in this story, where the secularist, republican, radical liberals of French Canada actually asked the church to oppose the integration, but they were denied. The church favored the Parti Bleu, the conservative party that was sitting in the regional government with one of the fathers of confederation at its head, Georges Etienne Cartier. As you might imagine, the church told people that not voting for pro-confederation politicians was against God's wishes and the conservatives achieved their goals. The Parti Rouge, having essentially failed on its mission, collapsed and restructured into the new federal system. It coalesced with the reform movement of Canada West into the Liberal Party of Canada, which at the same time developed local chapters of each party in their restructured provinces, as Canada East became Quebec and Canada West became Ontario. It wasn't all avoiding negatives though, as independence would also mean more political freedoms and autonomy from Britain's economic policy. The Hudson Bay Company, the private entity that had managed the vast western territory known as Prince Rupert's Land, was about to have its 100-year lease expire. Britain favored ceding this land to the Dominion as a territory, and this meant expanding the country by millions of square kilometers. The whole project set the conditions for an Old West Canadian frontier further inland. However, if you remember from last time, these were the lands of the Coureurs de Bois. The West was inhabited by the Ojibwe, the Cree, the Blackfoot, and the descendants of the French by racial marriages, the Métis. The Hudson Bay Company had inherited the fur trade and largely continued it with the same incentives. And though some social dynamics and markets were different, very little had changed in the way society worked in these lands. After the British established their own presence here, continuing to use the strategies of New France, there had been anglo metis communities emerging. Well, families from Ontario were thrilled to set up farms in the West. As the government was giving it out on sale amidst rising prices in urban areas, sound familiar? Members of the Orange Order also took the trip, a Protestant international fraternity with a civilizational concern of expanding Christianity to these lands. And that could mean either converting the natives or removing them so others could take their place. And it is in this climate that Louis Riel enters the story. Riel was born in Winnipeg to a Métis family. He had been an intelligent child, something that the Archbishop of Manitoba, Alexandre Antonin Taché, was impressed with as he tried to direct him to join the priesthood, which he shrugged off to study law in Montreal. He kept at it until the day his father died prematurely in 1864, which deeply affected Riel as he was away while his dad was on his deathbed. This turned him from an excellent student, in everyone's opinion, into a rebellious and flippant young man. Shortly after, the woman he was in love with could not marry him, as her parents forbade her from signing the contract of marriage, because Riel was mixed race. After doing some odd jobs, he became disillusioned with life in Canada East, and he returned to Winnipeg in 1868. From there, he could witness everything that was happening. Métis communities and Archbishop Taché urged the federal government to institute protections and responsible government such as that of Quebec. But they were ignored as land surveyors and settlers kept coming in and claiming established Métis land. Riel wasn't happy at all. He took the initiative and, as the Hudson Bay Company was about to surrender its authority and monopoly, he gathered a squadron and seized their center of operations in Prince Rupert's land, Fort Garry. Riel then declared himself president of the provisional government of Assiniboia, claiming authority over the entirety of Prince Rupert's land. This assembly established local police, militia, and trading regulations that fleshed out the structure of a state from the bones of the Hudson Bay Company. Many of the English settlers saw the move and tried to stop it, but their attempt at a coup was frustrated as the militia captured and jailed 48 of the conspirators. For all intents and purposes, Canada was not the law of these territories anymore. 
Despite all of this, this assembly did not seek independence from the Dominion. They wanted to create a Canadian province on their own terms, with equal French and English representation, religious education rights, and protections for native peoples. This was just an attempt to force Ottawa to the negotiation table, and it was successful in that it was difficult to ignore. Though Macdonald postured as if Riel wasn't a threat and everything was under control. Behind closed doors, the Canadian cabinet was negotiating a settlement with the Assiniboian Assembly, but then Riel made the biggest political mistake of his life. Among the people captured in the attempted putsch, there was a certain Thomas Scott, an Irish member of the Orange Order that constantly slandered and threatened the Métis. He tried to escape and insulted his guards, announcing he would personally kill them all when he was let out. To make a long story short, he was so annoying that Riel decided to execute him. He was found guilty of insubordination by the provisional government and shot by a firing squad. Most of the assembly had told Riel this would be a very stupid decision, but he was convinced that he was sending the message to Canada that the Métis should be respected. From his perspective, this was only another act affirming their sovereignty and authority. But Protestant Canada took it very differently. They now saw Riel as a bandit murderer and wanted him dead for killing one of their own. The Assiniboyan assembly managed to successfully negotiate terms that were acceptable to them. And the Manitoba Act was signed, creating a new province and a lot of land within it with special rights for the Métis. After the execution of Scott, however, they could not successfully guarantee amnesty to the members of the provisional government. Lots of Ontarians would simply not accept it. In Quebec, however, the assembly had charmed the hearts of the French, not especially out of love to the Métis, as the society had been the same one that produced the parents that denied Riel his college love, but out of a shared solidarity born of common grievances with the English. A French minority group had just established a government on its terms under the nose of the Tories. Catholics had triumphed over Protestants. This was romantic and gratifying to the French side of the rivalry. You can read in press articles of the time how, depending on this political bend, journals will call this uprising the Red River Rebellion or the Red River Resistance. As for Riel, he had to flee to the United States to escape bounty hunters, gangs and assassins. While out of the country, he essentially trolled the government of Canada by running for a seat in the federal parliament for his home district of Provence, winning and giving his seat to someone else to go back to exile. As Riel became the topic of the day, Macdonald was having a terrible time. In 1873, a corruption scheme of his government was repealed, known as the Pacific Scandal, and it got so bad that his party was removed from power, and the Liberals formed their first government ever under Alexander Mackenzie. Mackenzie oversaw five years of market liberalization and government reform, and despite some achievements in transparency and integrity, his tenure was ultimately frustrated by a worldwide economic recession known as the Panic of 1873. The reasons for the panic are very technical, but luckily for us, we have Realpolitik here, a YouTuber with an incredible amount of knowledge in finance who will describe to us what this situation was. Thanks for the introduction. The Panic of 1873 is normally attributed to the overextension of equity markets in the aftermath of the railroad boom. However, the reality of what would soon be viewed as one of the first truly globalized economic downturns was caused by a complex series of factors such as monetary supply, international commodity prices, interest rates, and commercial banking collapses. Take for example, greenback currency. Greenback currency was an absolutely vital portion of the American war effort. This piece of financial munition was used to purchase armaments, supplies, and other necessities for wartime. Considering the modern and expensive nature of the American Civil War, one could stand to reason that all of those railroads allowing for troop movements to be accelerated would require a much looser monetary supply in order to finance. The war that saw the first usage of many pieces of scientific technology that is today widely attributed to being hallmarks of modern warfare was developed alongside essential tools for financing this new form of warfare. Unlike in the Franco-Prussian War that would follow a decade later, the American government lacked a nation to impose a war debt on. It would be an obvious misstep to treat the reunited land as a conquered enemy. In the case of the aforementioned European conflict, the French paid a massive indemnity from 1871 to 1873. Over the course of these three years, France transferred what was, at the time, 22% of its annual gross domestic product. This enormous war debt that was imposed by the victor to some extent offset the cost of the conflict from the point of view of the German Empire. If one were to contrast the situation to America, one would quickly see a stark divide. 
Given the nature of the conflict, the winning side couldn't just impose a massive war debt to fund the reconstruction process, and thus greenback currency was continuously used as another instrument of monetary policy. The greenback currency was an early form of fiat money, and thus it was much easier to print and use for wartime spending. But ultimately, it led to hundreds of millions of dollars in circulation that was trading at roughly a 15% discount relative to regular gold and silver-backed US dollars at the time. That had to be reinstated. So, in effect, America had two active currencies. This was also paired with a tightening of the federal government's balance sheet in the form of the Coinage Act of 1873. This act, passed in April, not only moved the United States away from a gold and silver backed policy to a de facto gold exclusive convertibility process, further beating down the further depressed silver mining industry as a result of German monetary policy across the Atlantic, but it also effectively increased interest rates. This put further strain on an economy that was severely overextended. All of this came to a head in September 1873, the month of the crash when Jay and Cook's company collapsed. These major financial institutions collapsing led to the shattering of market confidence on a truly global scale. European countries and their subsequent colonies were hit by far the hardest. Even the aforementioned Germans suffered severely. Ironically, in true poetic fashion, the economy was even more extended in German markets due to the influx of capital from the French. Much like in America, the economic growth caused by widespread industrialization led to overspeculation on core industrial staples of the supply chain. Railroads often take the fall, but shipyards and naval infrastructure also felt the sting of the economic downturn. Similarly, important banking and insurance firms collapsed in German markets as well. The crash was felt on a tangible level by the working class globally. Labor markets crunched and subsequently unemployment spiked as wages declined. Poor monetary policy in an overly competitive export market and overextension crushed the economies and scarred a generation on both sides of the Atlantic. If history would ever have an event that could be placed firmly in the category of foreshadowing, this would be it. Now back to you. Thank you very much. And with that, we get back to the Mackenzie government. Canada and the world started undergoing a crisis. The Liberal government opened the doors to foreign competition to revitalize the economy. But this led to American companies and firms flooding the Canadian market. The United States was the powerhouse of the Second Industrial Revolution, and its technological power outcompeted almost every local Canadian business. This led to a boom and bust cycle on steroids. As the technology and industry of New England introduced itself into the country, but people lost their jobs by the thousands, their skills becoming outdated and unnecessary overnight. The catastrophic nature of this crisis began a trend of Canadian economic dependence on the United States. Mackenzie's free trade agreement modernized some sectors, but it was coming at the cost of being increasingly dragged to an American sphere of economic influence. These guardian towns along the border became a liability, as the hordes of unemployed could easily leave towards the south for better job opportunities in the richer, more diverse American economy. Surprisingly enough, this was true of Quebec as well. Though the English-speaking Ontarians had an easier time adapting to the United States, this poverty was generalized and the economic forces that moved the English Canadians to the south also moved French Canadians. Between 1871 and 1901, around 10% of Quebec's population would move to the United States for work. Many of them were the poorest of the poor, who had the least education, were unable to speak English and couldn't communicate effectively in this new society. They were also willing to work for very little money. Their precarious situation is sadly described in the grim nickname that Americans started using to refer to them, the Chinese of the East. MacDonald took advantage of this to come back to power on a platform of protectionism. He accused the liberals of selling the country to the United States with their free trade obsession. Mackenzie would only be in power for one term and MacDonald would come back to the office of prime minister, not leaving until the day he died. He then proceeded to implement the National Policy, an economic plan of tariffs to foreign capital and incentives to local industry. The strategy he defined would continue in some shape or form into the 1950s, and one of its key areas of development was turning Canada into the Egyptian food bank of the Rome that be the British Empire. Settling the prairies and resuming his plans of populating the West, now that years of rail building let him go even further into the interior. The settlers started to come back to Manitoba. Once again, there were English Protestants lavishly taking the country, a violation of the promises of the Manitoba Act, which among many things guaranteed land to the Métis. Taché decided to campaign to get French Canadians to come in and balance this out, 
but Quebec was desperately trying to keep its own people in and colonize its own frontier by taking space from the Eastern First Nations. Since Quebec wouldn't listen, Taché, with the help of Riel, took his campaign to the French Canadians of New England, but not enough people could be convinced. Other problems were rising too. During Mackenzie's government, a piece of legislation called the Indian Act had been passed. This document made all Native Americans wards of the state. That is, the state became their legal guardian in the same way it presided over orphans. As American and Canadian buffalo hunters had nearly exterminated the species, many Blackfoot and Cree peoples agreed to transition to an agricultural way of life with the help of the Canadian state. The transition was agreed on in a series of cooperation treaties. However, Canada wasn't much help, as tools, food and supplies were very inconsistently delivered. And since they were wards, if the state failed to provide attention to the First Nations, well, it was up to the government to fulfill its promises to itself. Compound this with inexperience and massive crop failure during a harsh winter, and soon there was unrest among the First Nations too. Even English Canadians were mad, as life in the West was not meeting their expectations. The corrupt railroad company that was meant to connect their towns to the goods and services of the East simply decided to lay their rails elsewhere as they started playing influence games with the location. They knew wherever they laid the rails would become the most valuable real estate. So this was an amazing opportunity for backroom deals. And then, complications in construction made them flirt with bankruptcy giving a headache to literally everyone. The cheap land offered by McDonald now seemed like a giant scam. Given all these factors, the factions coalesced again to repeat Riel's tried and tested strategy, declaring a local administration and forcing the federal government to negotiate. It just so happened that Riel was returning to Canada to settle a personal land dispute. And really, who was better than the hero of the first civil disobedience to lead the second? The committee instantly gave Riel a position of leadership again. However, Riel was a very different man now. During his exile, he started developing several mental health complications. Having to avoid constant attempts on his life might have made him paranoid and megalomaniac. He spent some months in asylums under a fake name, retreating ever more into his Catholic religion, with a weird spin that he started to believe God had chosen him to be a prophet of the new world a la Joseph Smith. He prayed for the Métis who he now wanted to be a chosen people and wrote treaties on theology that he signed as Louis David Riel, prophet, infallible pontiff and priest king. And well, whatever passed in the 19th century as therapy allowed him to recover some sense of himself. But the moment he started being acclaimed and empowered by this council, his tendencies reinvigorated. Then the first battle with the mounted police came and the Métis and First Nations warriors managed to win. As Riel watched from the sidelines in prayer, he took this successful operation as a sign that God favored his cause. This day, the 26th of March of 1885, was the first battle of the bloodiest internal conflict in Canadian history, the Northwest Rebellion. Things were, however, different from the Red River Theatre this time around. Riel's messianic rhetoric alienated the church leaders and some of his white supporters. Many English settlers didn't think they'd be compelled to take up arms, so they abandoned the coalition after gunfire broke out. Worst of all, now that three members of law enforcement were dead, MacDonald was furious and he called a militia to arms, one that he could now quickly transport to the west with the incomplete railway. This is what he said as he made the case for intervention to the House of Commons. We have done all we could to put them on themselves. We have done all we could to make them work as agriculturalists. We have done all we could, by the supply of cattle, agricultural implements and instruction, to change them from nomadic to an agricultural life. We have had very considerable success. We have had infinitely more success during our short period than the United States have had during 25 years. We have had a wonderful success, but still we have had the Indians. And then, in these half-breeds enticed by white men, the savage instinct was awakened, the desire of plunder, aye, and perhaps the desire of sculping, the savage idea of a warlike glory which pervades the breast of most men, civilized or uncivilized, was aroused in them, forgetting all the kindness that had been bestowed upon them, forgetting all the gifts that had been given to them, 
forgetting all that the government, the white people, and the Parliament of Canada had been doing for them in trying to rescue them from barbarity, forgetting that we had given them reserves, the means to cultivate those reserves, and the means of education on how to cultivate them. Forgetting all these things, they rose against us. We acquired the Northwest Country in 1870. Not a life was lost, not a blow was struck, not a pound nor a dollar was spent in warfare in that long period that has since intervened. I have not hesitated to tell this house again and again that we will not always hope to maintain peace with the Indians, that the savage was still a savage, and until he ceased to be a savage, we were always in danger of a collision, in danger of war, in danger of an outbreak. I am only surprised that we have been able to so long to maintain peace, that from 1870 until 1885, not one single blow, not one single murder, not one single loss of life has taken place. A couple of battles took place, but just like the Patriots, they were put down by the army. This time, it only took 47 days. Three days after the core of his forces were defeated at the Battle of Batoche, Riel surrendered. He was put on trial and McDonald's government walked the extra mile to make sure he'd be put to death. They appealed to a law not present in Canadian criminal law but in British criminal law, in which high treason was punished by execution. They tried him in the city of Regina so that there would be no Métis jurors at his trial, as it would have been required under Manitoba law. Riel's appeal to be allowed to be tried in Quebec was also ignored. His defense pleaded insanity, citing his fits of religious passion as evidence that he couldn't have made the decisions he made in full possession of his mental faculties, but Riel disagreed. He presented himself as rather agreeable and convinced of his motives to the court. He defended his Christian messaging, but said that his fundamental concerns were rather practical. The good treatment, rights and liberties of the Northwest. All in all, it wasn't enough to save him. The court found him guilty and, though they made a recommendation of mercy to the judge, he still decided to hang him. Pleas across French Canada were made to pardon him, but they fell on deaf ears. MacDonald had little time to celebrate his near completed railway, as the public perception of this trial was taking more and more of his attention. Regardless, his stance on it was clear. He was of the idea that Riel would hang though every dog in Quebec barked in his favor, which is something he actually said. Riel marked a great division between the grand identity narratives of English and French Canada. In Ontario, the militia that had stopped the uprising was given a hero's return, and the death of Riel was celebrated in public demonstrations. Two new provinces would emerge in the prairies, Saskatchewan and Alberta, and these provinces were led by empowered English Canadians with the aftertaste of the Northwest Rebellion. They would strongly pressure the federal government not to enforce on them French minority rights in schooling and representation, and by the mid-1890s, the English-led legislative assemblies of the newly incorporated territories rolled back most of the protections to French and Catholicism granted by the Manitoba Act, deeply affecting French and Métis communities. As for the First Nations, many indigenous warriors were hanged. Big Bear, Crowfoot and Poundmaker, the leaders of each of their factions, would be arrested on charges of treason, even if they themselves had wanted no part in an uprising like this. The nuance was ignored and agitated settlers would ramp up their efforts of assimilation. In the following decades, an emergent Department of Indian Affairs would skyrocket the number of residential schools in Canada, institutions designed to cleanse indigenous cultures and integrate the First Nations into white society. In practice, these were government institutions of child abuse, like something out of the Golden Compass. Physical and mental violence was rampant, and their consequences still echo in indigenous communities to this day. The government of Canada state-sponsored a mental health crisis for itself a hundred years ago. Many survivors are now part of a massive alcoholism epidemic, and that's the survivors, as it's not uncommon for forensic investigators to find hundreds of unmarked graves in the grounds of these schools. These schools had the state purpose of killing the Indian in the child to save the man, but quite often they only killed a child. If anything, it was the First Nations who were the biggest victims of westward expansion. And something that we shouldn't forget is that these institutions, though funded by the state, were administered by Christian churches. Back in French Canada, there was a dark and furious mood. What Riel had represented to Quebec was a line of defense for the rights of Francophones in the West. 
He was now dead, and with him, a lot of the progress he had made on the matters of civil rights. More importantly for Quebec, if the federal government of Canada had successfully taken away the guarantees of the French in the frontier, could that mean that they were next? They did not know, but protest songs were heard across the province as the tune of La Marseillaise echoed in the streets. MacDonald doomed the Conservative Party in Quebec. Since 1897, the province hasn't had a single premier from the CPC, either the historical ones or the modern one. For the next two generations, Quebec would have at its front a series of liberal governments. However, these liberals were economic liberals. Quebec was still a defensive Catholic society, protective of its social norms and customs. The coming governments would usher in reforms for administration and the business class, but they'd continued threading very carefully around the church. The conservative collapse would also pave the way for the first francophone prime minister, Wilfried Laurier. Laurier had been a member of the Parti Rouge, though a moderate, and under his administration, lots of reforms took place in Canada. A period of rapid industrialization and growth rushed over the country. He opened the doors to immigration once again to address the depopulation of the late 19th century and bring people to the West. Though his policies often favored white newcomers to the detriment of everyone else, and many ethnic minorities like the Chinese in British Columbia and the First Nations clashed against his ideas of racial supremacy and the consequent systemic oppression. In the context of Quebec, the steady and painful economic growth of the province continued, revitalized by a more mature vision of Canadian trade. Emerging industries in wood, shipbuilding, locomotives, textiles and manufacturing were diversifying and strengthening the province's economic integration. Still, the key inequality remained that in Quebec, francophones always seemed to be the workers and debtors, whereas anglophones were the business owners and stockholders. Either way, the government gained new income streams with which it could cover an increasing amount of state expenses, though the creation of social security nets as those emerging in Germany, for example, were still obstructed by the church. Ultramontanism evolved by this point into a sort of clerical nationalism, with proponents such as Lionel Cru continuing to argue that the church should preside over matters spiritual, social and cultural. Going into the 20th century, they continued to be politically powerful. These people were still nationalists in that they argued a strong church meant a protected French-Canadian community from what they perceived was a Protestant confederation and the tyranny of Ottawa. In the 1920s, many prohibitions inspired by the clerical nationalists were in place. Some are very silly and funny, like all children under the age of 16 were banned from cinemas out of fear of subversive, unchristian movies. Others were more somber and cruel. For example, it wasn't until 1924 that, over the opposition of the church, the liberals legalized adoption. Some of you watching may have relatives in living memory that, had they been orphans in Quebec, for a good amount of time they would have been unable to legally find adoptive parents because the church wanted to preserve the idea of the conjugal family and shame those who wouldn't comply. Similar things happened with the implementation of poverty relief and new schools, as the church saw charity and charity-like programs as its jurisdiction, same with education. Still, as long as the liberals could position themselves as a force of economic development that didn't threaten the moral pillars of Catholicism, they could continue governing and getting some important reforms out every blue moon. This was still la belle époque, and French Canadians were not universally under the thumb of the church. Granted. Many had to operate in the shadows, but liberals, feminists, socialists and liberal nationalists were a phenomenon here too, as in every Western country. Another contention is that these progressives also had Catholic counterparts, who were often more popular. There were Catholic feminists and Catholic communitarians that promoted Christianized versions of the ideas of the New Age. For the vast majority of people, meaning the urban and rural poor, as Quebec became industrialized, the fraternity between French Catholics did not weaken, but strengthened. Many community leaders in Quebec had responded to the call of Pope Leo XIII's 1891 encyclical, 
titled The Rights and Duties of Capital and Labor. In it, he condemned leftist revolutionaries and rampant capitalists, promoting in its place Christian solidarity as a remedy to the ills of the time. This translated into an industrial capitalist society that tried its best to keep the gears of Catholicism turning, no matter how hard it was. Suppose you were a French-Canadian Catholic. If you wanted a loan from the community bank, it was most likely a Catholic institution. If your children went to school, the community school was a reformed Catholic school. If you wanted to join a workers' union, you could join some of the many conflicting socialist organizations that the government was cracking down on, or you could join the bigger and more interconnected Catholic Workers' Confederation of Canada. Even if you wanted to join a sports team like lacrosse, hockey or football, there were committed Catholic teams that would cater to your values and festivities. The few exceptions were reserved for the English Protestant minority, which further alienated itself. With federal development, something interesting starts happening as well, as the old capital of Quebec City starts becoming less important. Quebec City is located at a point where the St. Lawrence narrows. That is quite literally what its name means. It is a dream location if you are a naval empire trying to project power upstream. But as Canada became more and more its own entity, Montreal started to emerge as a more populous and bustling center, as it sat at the midway between Ontario, the eastern townships, and Quebec. The cities had been toe-to-toe -to -toe in importance, but going into the 1890s, Montreal was emerging as the center of Quebecois economic life. Montreal universities like the École Polytechnique and McGill would see significant renovation with the turn of the century. The public transportation system reached tens of millions of yearly passengers. Montreal would also become a hub of transcontinental rail networks and ships going up and down the St. Lawrence. Over the years, it would absorb more and more of the province's total population, as many came from rural areas and abroad to participate in urban life, until around one in six Quebecers was a Montrealer in 1901. Though this city was the darling child of this economic growth, all cities in Quebec enjoyed some degree of Victorian urbanization, and they also suffered from it. In working-class neighborhoods, disease, poor hygiene and scarcity were rampant. Tragically, all those children that French-Canadian women were having even doubt in the census, as infant mortality was high due to poor living conditions. The so-called revenge of the cradle was starting to wane, as cramped cities and poor services made big families less viable. The central question of Quebecois society right now was about morality and capitalism. The liberals were concerned with economic growth and rights, while the church leaders wondered just how to make these changes compatible with the values they so desired to protect. The debate would not matter, though, as two great matters derailed the conversation. The Great War and the Great Depression. French Canada had always had an awkward relation with war. One of the core points of distinctiveness between the Anglophones and the Francophones was the issue of their role in the Empire and its force. Even among pro-British Francophones such as Laurier, there still existed a perspective that they had only one nation, whereas the English Canadians had two. French Canadians had refused to join both Boer Wars, as they did not want to participate in what they perceived was a repression of another ethnic minority within the British Empire. English Canadians, on the other hand, tended to be more supportive of sending divisions and volunteers. Adding to existing tensions, these further divided Canadians. The Quebecers were seen by the English as cowards and traitors, whereas Quebec was mad that this distant island was even asking them to die in the name of liberties they did not wholly enjoy. An ethnic element also continued to create strong divisions. There is a famous story from 1899 in which Henri Bourassa, an important MP from Quebec and one of these liberal clerical nationalists, was arguing against sending Canadians to the Second Boer War in the House of Commons. As he tried to explain his reasons in French, a heckler from the English bench shouted at him to speak white. The First World War brought these divisions to light. Laurier stopped being Prime Minister in 1911, and he was replaced by the pro-war, pro-empire Robert Borden. Borden would deploy lots of people since the beginning of the war, mainly among first-generation British immigrants, but he would ramp up the number until 1 in 16 Canadians were expected to serve. Quebec had the same apathy to British wars as it always had, but trying to fill his quotas, the Borden government issued the Military Service Act in 1917, mandating service to thousands of young men. Quebec opposed conscription and hard. There was widespread discontent and protest. On Easter of 1918, 
Thousands of demonstrators sacked a police station in Quebec City that was holding an arrested man who couldn't produce his draft exemption. Violence, civil disobedience and the destruction of property raged through the first days of April. And Borden didn't handle the crisis well. His government had passed and enacted the War Measures Act of 1914, which gave the federal government extraordinary powers to act during times of crisis. This law was used to put down the protests with military force, but they ended in a fire exchange between protesters and soldiers, where four Quebecois were killed and dozens were injured. In the end, conscription didn't help much, as many people filed conscientious objections and signed into non-combat roles. Importantly, before any further deployments could happen, the war ended two years later. The main thing this debacle did was add red ink to Quebec's long list of grievances. A frustrated provincial government put forward a motion to break up confederation, but it wasn't voted on. The proposition just stood there as a foreshadowing symbol an expression of resentment towards Ottawa, the English, and the War Measures Act. Put a pin on that last one. It's gonna come back later. The 1920s saw Quebecers begin to question the role in Canada. A movement called the Autonomist Movement started to argue for more local governance, and the idea of independence started floating around in some circles in public consciousness. This became another of the great debates in Quebec, along with the discussion about morality and industrial life. Then the Great Depression came and all these debates were replaced with more existential concerns. Quebec and Ontario were developed enough to hold out through the worst of the Depression, but Canada, especially the West, was still an export-oriented economy that provided resources to foreign industries. With the Depression and the collapse of international trade, every province had a GDP decrease. The only ones that didn't do too badly were the Maritimes, and that's because their economy was so bad it didn't have much to lose. Living standards in the 1930s worsened significantly, as unemployment and homelessness rose, while immigration and urbanization declined. A movement started where people started returning to the countryside. And, in Quebec, the provincial liberal government seemed to be haunted again by the coast of Mackenzie. They lost the mandate of heaven, to put it one way, and their failure to stop conscription compounded with the breakdown of the world's economy would pave the road for another great political transformation. In Quebec, unemployment climbed up to about a quarter of the population. Lots of mayors declared bankruptcy. Wages were reduced by 40%. The community support structures encouraged by the church helped many find a degree of security, but the crisis was beyond small communities' ability to solve. Without the welfare state that the liberal government of Louis-Alexandre Tachereau refused to implement, despite charity and relief, living conditions worsened dramatically. Surprisingly enough, some of the people who were not doing so terribly were subsistence farmers, who could generally stay out of food rationing. In this climate of uncertainty, political radicals of all sorts started to emerge. Communists and socialists were making their own proposals, but they were also being cracked down on by the federal government, which, through various measures, outlawed the activities of the Communist Party of Canada through the 30s, until its eventual ban in 1939. Quebec overall had religious sensitivities that made the province hostile to far-left solutions, so they were courted by the right-wing alternatives. There were also many fascists in Quebec, some of whom were Nazi-inspired, but they never gained much power. What did gain relevance were right-of-right-wing organizations, such as Jeune Canada, an actively racist, xenophobic group of French-Canadian nationalist students, mostly from the University of Montréal. More movements like this one emerged in Quebec, and the targets of their anger were Jews, immigrants, and the English minority, whether they were part of the elites or not, because again, the business class of Quebec was dominated by educated English Protestants from Montreal, who had over the decades benefited from the political status quo, and in this time of crisis, they were easy if not obvious targets of social resentment. Tachereau's pro-business government was seen as a friend of this class, so his departure was only a matter of time. The only question was, what would replace it? And the answer was Maurice Duplessis. Duplessis was a lawyer from a small city in Quebec. He was a charismatic, strong-willed conservative who knew how to construct enemies and talk to the vast, underprivileged class of rural Quebecois. The conservatives saw him as an opportunity to win Quebec back, but he essentially took over the party and made it his own thing. He allied with a nationalist splinter of the liberals, formed a party called Union Nationale, and postured himself as the solution to Quebec's problems. The Catholic Church, which still had a significant amount of power in 1933, outlined a series of state reforms known as the Social Restoration Program, with lots of supporters on the right and the left. 
Duplessis just took over the cost and ran with it as his platform. After a landslide election in which he more than halved the liberal seats in the assembly, Duplessis went on to expose the extent of corruption of the Tachereau government. This was all as leader of the opposition, because after uncovering this public scandal in which Tachereau ended up resigning, Duplessis would become the premier of Quebec in 1936, with control of 85% of the legislative assembly, and he ruled like an authoritarian. His tenure was marked by false promises and political repression. The first thing he did after securing his position was purging the nationalist liberals. He started to muscle leftists, banning publications under the Padlock Act of 1937, which empowered his attorney general to seize material or the publishers of material that he deemed Bolshevik in spirit. Of course, this didn't stay within the margins of anti-communism, because sympathizers of the Spanish Republic, unions, and even journalists started feeling the backlash of the padlocks. He also largely ignored the PRS, letting only a few of its reforms through, mainly the agrarian projects that would secure the votes of his face, the rural French Canadians who composed the core of his sympathizers in the countryside. He would also politicize immigration to Quebec to his benefit, by calculating newcomers by political temperament while communicating to the public that he cared about the people, whereas the liberals cared about foreigners. Fundamentally, Duplessis' first term was very politically unsavvy. He ruled like a dictator from day one, pushing forward an aggressive, conservative nanny state. An invasive backlash to the nuanced identity conversations happening in Quebec, interrupting them with a swift imposition of the ideas of the clerical nationalists. As one of the first things he did was place a crucifix in the Blue Room, the Legislative Assembly of Quebec. He also purged the entire police department of Montreal on his first week of office, just to be able to restaff it himself and make sure that the new officers would be sympathetic to him. The question is, does this remind you of someone? Well. Hold on to that thought if it does, because the story of Duplessis has something to teach us. He would be ousted in 1939 for his rough style and democratic uncertainty he triggered in the province. Le Chef, as he was known, defined the challenges and forms of Quebec's politics for the rest of the century and though he would leave as a political force as all personality politicians eventually do, his mark in Quebec is yet another thing that remains. It remains both in the social and political forms that conservatism took after the death of the CPC, as Quebec's right-wing parties from this point onwards have been regional interest groups that have split or are descendants of his Union Nationale. But more poetically, it remains printed into the flag of the province, a flag that bears a cross and four fleurs de lis, symbols of France and French identity, but also of Jesus and the Trinity. A banner much like the field banners of the regiments that marched through the land 300 years before him, in opposition to the English and hand in hand with the church. Duplessis has a complicated legacy and perhaps something that is relevant to our times is that despite the absolute circus that was his first term, he had a second and led a government that would rule Quebec into the 60s. Well, tighten your Oxfords because exploring that legacy and the 20th century is exactly what we're doing next time. Bonjour, hi, once again. This project was another slow cook, but it was bigger than the last one, so I hope it was worth the wait. Importantly, I also had the help of various friends who were as passionate about this project as I was. Nyanja, who is my main animator, illustrator, and an old great friend of mine and of this channel. She also read a passage of the Brothers Karamazov as she's also a voice actress and volunteered to add something in the video. She works incredibly hard to get these things done and she deserves a lot of appreciation for it. Kraut, who also drew for this video and continues to be an amazing friend and supporter of mine. Realpolitik, who explained to us the Panic of 1873 with his extensive knowledge of finance and accurate reading of the facts, as well as voicing Dostoevsky. Teabag, one of the main artists for the Crowd channel, who came in and drew some amazing slides on what's maybe the most abstract topic of the video. Gascony, a great artist who was the first person to reach out and volunteer for this project. He drew the opening segment, which was also the entirety of the preview. This process, who made an astounding amount of great slides all over this video and really had a full-on Sigma grind set when it came to pumping out art. <laughs> Paxlark, who did a stellar job with the Duplessis segment earlier this year. 
Mrs. Human Car, who drew the thumbnail, I think that needs no explanations, it's amazing, she's amazing. And Mike1917, an artist from Crowd's team who volunteered to crank some slides and get this whole thing done faster. He tried to replicate Gascony's style for visual consistency and that was very cool. You might have noticed on the screen that many of these artists run their own YouTube channels. They do pull and ball documentaries as well and cover historical and geopolitical topics like I do. If you like this channel, you will like theirs. Check out their profiles, every contributor has their social media of choice promoted in the description. Someone very important was Duncan Riley. You might remember him as the voice of Voltaire from the last episode. Well, this time he helped me proofread the entirety of the script, which was somewhere north of 25 pages. Duncan, unlike me, is an actual historian, and if the topic of nation-building interests you beyond Quebec, he wrote a very interesting thesis covering three Latin American countries. The document is free, and you can access the download link in the description. I also had the pleasure to host a couple of voice actors for the quotes. Both of them rocked their roles as well. Stefan Mashford was featured in this video as John A. MacDonald. You can follow him on Twitter and I have to give him a special mention for helping me read a difficult quote that many people were a bit reluctant to say out loud. I mean, reasonably so. <laughs> and Liam Taylor, who was featured as Lord Durham. He also read the verses of the Canadian National Anthem and is an amazing voice actor who was really helpful, reading such verbose and discursive quotes and orienting me on what to do with my audio setup. I'd recommend working with him if you have any voice acting needs. For sound editing and refining, I relied on Martinius TP. Martin came in to do last minute work so that the audio would turn out well, and his job was amazing. We've had a dramatic improvement in the smoothness of the segments and it was all thanks to him. His SoundCloud, in which you can find his music as well as additional projects, is in the description. I also have to give a special thank you to Darla Daniels. She's a Métis fiddler who I contacted months ago about the possibility of using her live performance as background music of this video. Métis fiddling is a unique way of playing the violin that emerged from this unique cultural blend. I was looking for performances to include in Riel's segment, and hers were perfect. More music was included under free use licenses and also some people whose tracks I asked for permission to use. All of these are in the description as well. Thank you all for your incredible work. This project would have taken much longer to make without your help and it would have missed the passion and enthusiasm that each of you put into the craft. Everyone here deserves as much credit as I do, so please go to their social media and show them some love. Here's a piece of fan art of them by Maple Syrup Girl, um, you can find her Twitter here, I guess. She was too expensive, I couldn't hire her for this video. Such is life. <laughs> also, there are three guys I have to mention by name. Uh, Spetsy Boy, Fennec the Opni Liberal, and Hey, it's Alex. They're members of my Discord server, which you can also find in the description. And very close to a release date, they went to the parking lot beneath which the ruins of the old parliament are. I asked for a 10 second clip I could use of the lot, but they actually recorded a whole hangout. You know, I can see why the British were so into this land. Because oh, it's really cold, is. wet and miserable, Feels just like, like home. London. <laughs> they also took the opportunity to show me pictures of authentic Quebecois poutine, because they didn't like this one I tried to make and they are clearly wrong. Finally, images, assets and clips uh, that I didn't make were used in this video. You can find all the original files in the description as well. The content here was employed under fair use, public domain and creative commons licenses, which means that I am the only person responsible for the presentation and the arguments made. The creators of these media have solely provided the media itself under the relevant licenses. And that's it. If you, dear viewer, are among the 10% of the audience who made it to this point, comment Nomad's Putin was better and I will give you a hard reaction. I'm glad you've stuck so long and that you waited so long for this video. Thank you for your patience. When we come back for part 3, we'll discuss modern Quebec, the independence movement, and the questions of nationhood. See you then. Subscribe to Nomad Star.